um, excuse this very unusual way to moderate the beginning of the session. I'm in the Viennese underground, but I was told to connect you to right there. My name is Peter Bayer, a member of the Austrian Parliament, where I chair the Committee on Development Cooperation for more than 80 years, and I'm also a member of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, where I chair the Committee on Equality and Non-Discrimination. Sexual and reproductive rights have always been at the core of my political activities. I also wrote my master thesis on HIV and how a, um, a human rights-based policy could look like and approach can look like. And as you all know, tomorrow there will start a UN high-level meeting on HIV AIDS. And usually we meet in New York City at the UN headquarters, but not this year where we come together virtually. And I'm very proud uh, that I can tell you that more than 150 participants have been registered to this IPU event. So what's the objective of our debate um, come together? It is first to discuss the new global aid strategy on and the main lines of action that will emerge from the high-level vision of HIV AIDS. We will learn more a little bit later about that. And second, it's also about to highlight the role of parliamentarians to ensure adequate investment in HIV AIDS and health and supportive legislation to address inequality, stigma, and discrimination. I'm very happy that I now can announce Mr. Brazo Pacheco. He is president of the Interparliamentary Union. Please, uh, Duarte, the floor is yours. May I? Yes, please. Go ahead. Thank you so much. Your Excellency, the co facilitator of ILEV meeting, Your Excellency, the Executive Director of UNAIDS, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor for me to welcome you to this important uh, event on the whole of Parliament to put an end on AIDS. I, all, I wish to thank our partners of UNAID, of course, for working together with IPU to bring uh, you all together today. I am pleased to see so many colleagues from the five continents and a special welcome to the members of the United States Congress. It's always a pleasure to have you working with IPU. Dear colleagues, they will have meetings starting tomorrow and will be essential to make sure we got on track to end AHV and AIDS by 2030. It is not just the target of the Sustainable Development Goals. It's essential for lives and well-being of members of people are around the world. This cannot be achieved without parliaments. You know that IPU has adopted a statement on the occasion of the high-level meeting to call on parliaments to become leaders in IHV response. And we realize this is essential to millions and millions of persons. And uh, you know that uh, the role of parliaments are essential because we need to approve budget to this war against this pandemic, but also to create legislation that protects human beings and defend human rights against all the discrimination. We know that nowadays, 
we are living with other pandemic, the COVID-19. That uh, take uh, attention of the world, attention of the media, attention of scientists, and also put all the resources to win this battle against COVID-19. So we need to put the AHV and this pandemic again in our agenda, in our societies, to be assured that we will achieve what we wish. A society that will eradicate this pandemic before 2030 and to give the same opportunities to the healthy, educated, and realize our full potential as human beings. I call on all of you, dear colleagues, to continue working day by day to make it happen. At the IPU, we look forward to continue working with parliaments, UN aids, and working together to play a part in the AIDS response. I, I wish you, dear colleagues, a very productive discussion. Thank you very much, Mr. Pacheco, for your important uh, introduction and work. And now it's a pleasure to hand over to Mitch Feifel, who is ambassador and permanent representative of Australia and co-facilitator of the high-level meeting on HIV AIDS. And I also want to mention that uh, Australia was the host country in 2014 at, of the AIDS conference in Melbourne. And it's also the home of the gorgeous touch Michael Kirby, one of the most eloquent ambassadors, let me say, um, against discrimination. Please, Mr. Ambassador, the floor is yours. Well, thank you so much, uh, and it's great to uh, to be with so many colleagues. And can I thank uh, the uh, Interparliamentary Union and uh, UNAIDS for uh, hosting uh, this important event uh, at this important time? Uh, well, as uh, the president mentioned before, uh, tomorrow is the first day of the 2021 uh, high-level meeting of uh, the General Assembly on uh, HIV/AIDS, and. Uh, this is a crucial time for the global AIDS response because we are reflecting on uh, the progress that we've made towards the 2016 commitments. And it's important that we take a moment to pause uh, and uh, look at what has been achieved. But equally, uh, it is clear that not enough has been done. Uh, we didn't meet the global targets for 2020. Uh, and right now, there is a real risk that we will not achieve the SDG target of ending the AIDS epidemic by 2030. Uh, for our part, um, and uh, on my own part, uh, Australia is very proud to be uh, working with Namibia uh, to co-facilitate the political declaration on HIV AIDS, uh, which will be adopted uh, at the HLM this week. As a co-facilitator, uh, Australia has tried to broker agreement on an ambitious declaration, uh, one that puts human rights, science, uh, and addressing inequalities at the centre of the HIV response. Uh, a declaration uh, that seeks to put the global response back on track. However, uh, our work doesn't end with the uh, adoption of the political declaration. Uh, if we are really to uh, reinvigorate uh, the HIV AIDS response, the commitments made this week uh, need to be followed by renewed action, including implementation of the priority actions set out in the Global AIDS Strategy uh, 2021 uh, to 2026. And parliamentarians uh, can play a crucial role in translating these commitments into action. Uh, and they can do this with uh, the tools we already have uh, because we know these tools work. Uh, partnerships between governments, affected communities, researchers and clinicians. We know these partnerships mm. work. Uh, Evidence-based programs targeting key populations work and addressing the inequalities that drive the epidemic and stigma 
and discrimination is crucial. And uh, I speak from uh, my own experience as a former parliamentarian and cabinet minister uh, when saying that parliamentarians and their staff have a unique opportunity uh, and an invaluable leadership role. And my own country is an example of this. In Australia, uh, the government quickly acknowledged and responded to the emerging HIV AIDS uh, epidemic in the 1980s, way back then. Uh, a bipartisan political decision was made early uh, to foster an effective partnership between communities, healthcare providers and governments. And this really was instrumental in getting agreement to adopt activities to lower HIV transmission, uh, such as needle and syringe programs and public health campaigns. And this bipartisanship, uh, I'm pleased to say, uh, continues to be reflected uh, in the group of parliamentary friends for action on HIV AIDS, bloodborne viruses, and sexually transmitted infections uh, in uh, the uh, context of uh, the Australian Parliament. Uh, the group offers parliamentarians from all parties an opportunity to improve their understanding uh, of the uh, primary uh, care, the, the role of primary care for HIV, uh, and also uh, to hear about current issues from uh, civil society organisations. And state and territory governments, I should add, uh, have also established AIDS councils to uh, deliver uh, local, uh, locally tailored responses uh, in HIV to communities, uh, driven largely uh, by people living with HIV. Now, uh, the consistently low rate of HIV infections in Australia uh, has been attributed to uh, these uh, collection of actions. And legislation also has a role. Uh, and as members of lawmaking bodies, parliamentarians have the very unique opportunity to address laws that undermine access to HIV and health services and to address laws that discriminate. Well, colleagues, we now find ourselves in uh, this uncharted territory in which we're battling both HIV AIDS and COVID at the same time as the President uh, referenced earlier. Uh, but the response to both challenges does bring up some common themes, uh, the need to engage communities, uh, the importance of promoting and protecting human rights, uh, the need to know who the key population groups at risk are, uh, and the importance of non-partisan political will and collaboration across borders. Experience shows us that when communities are proactively involved in ensuring their own wellbeing, then success is more likely. Uh, for our part, Australia's HIV strategy explicitly recognises key populations disproportionately impacted by HIV. And for us, it's, uh, it's essential to make sure our efforts are inclusive, responsive and connected to the needs and concerns of these communities. For colleagues, beyond uh, the similarities in responses to HIV, AIDS and COVID, um, parliamentarians can also play an important role in ensuring that efforts to urgently address the COVID pandemic don't result in the diversion away from other important health issues such as HIV AIDS. Efforts to respond to COVID and HIV uh, can be mutually reinforcing, uh, strengthened health systems, applying evidence, involving communities, addressing inequalities. Dear colleagues, we can only end the AIDS epidemic through understanding, through respect, through partnership. And uh, your collective leadership will be critical in this. And I uh, really look forward to hearing uh, more ideas uh, today uh, on the value of and the contribution that parliamentarians can make uh, to uh, end the HIV AIDS pandemic. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for your uh, welcome remarks, uh, Mr. Fifi. And uh, did I get it right that Vini Bianjena will come later? I think yeah. I saw him. I am here. You are here. Sorry, sorry. That's then welcome. Uh, it's great to have you here with us. Uh, so now we will hear the keynote presentation by Vini Bianjena, Executive Director of UNAIDS. Please, our a special pleasure to have you with us. Thank you, Chair. The honorable parliamentarians, colleagues, friends, let me first thank IPU 
and the leader, Martin Chongook, for the close collaboration with UNAIDS and for organizing this very important side event on the role of parliamentarians in addressing the inequalities that drive HIV AIDS. I would also like to thank the IPU Advisory Group on Health and the IPU Governing Council for adopting the statement on HIV and AIDS on the occasion of this high level meeting, which will add weight, political weight to the outcome <clears throat> of the HLM and to the political declaration we expect. It is 20 years since the first UN General Assembly special session and 40 years since the first cases of AIDS were reported. In this important year, we also mark 25 years since the world came together at the United Nations and established the joint program on AIDS, UN AIDS, which I have the honor to lead. AIDS is one of the deadliest pandemics of modern times. Since the start of the epidemic 40 years ago, 77 and a half million people have become infected with HIV. And we have lost 34.7 million people who've died of AIDS. But in the past 40 years, we've also seen huge progress. The world came together, scientists came together, governments came together, movements of activists came together and fought. And today, 75% of all the people living with HIV are now on treatment, living healthy lives. That's over 27 million people who are on treatment today. We've reduced AIDS deaths by 43% in the last 10 years. Progress, however, has been slower on reducing new infections. We've just reduced them by 30% in the last 10 years. So we need to do more. In 2016, there was a high level meeting on AIDS. That was the last one, five years ago. It set ambitious targets that were to be met by 2020 to put AIDS on the path to ending it by 2030. However, these global targets were missed. Last year, when we did our annual report, we showed that globally the targets had been missed. However, when you unpack, some countries did achieve them and even surpass them. And these are not only rich countries with means, it's also developing countries that achieve them. A country like Swaziland, small landlocked, low income country achieved them. So those targets were achievable, but were missed. We find ourselves at a critical moment to get the world back on track to end AIDS as a public health threat by 2030 which is one of the targets in the Sustainable Development Goals. And, and the, the COVID-19 pandemic threatens to blow us even further off course. We're now meet, facing two colliding pandemics. Parliamentarians and parliaments have a critical role to play in this fight against AIDS and in upholding the right to health for all people without discrimination. You are the champions of the people. Nothing makes me happier than to speak with parliamentarians. I was elected three times to the Ugandan parliament, my country, and it was one of the jobs I loved the most, serving the people, serving my community. And the power that you come with, your power to shape the budget, to make budget decisions. Here you have power to show that HIV is an important pandemic and to resource it adequately. You vote, you vote and adopt laws that promote human rights of all citizens, including their right to health. And I will come to that. You play a crucial role as guardians of democratic values. 
fundamental freedoms. And your role is so important in strengthening public trust. You also take us from talk to action by the power you have. Because we know, we know that countries that have progressive laws and policies that have strong and inclusive health systems have the best outcomes against HIV, progressive laws and policies and inclusive health systems. They are the countries that have achieved or exceeded the 2020 targets set by the General Assembly in 2016. And we also know that countries with punitive laws that do not take a human rights approach to health, that sell health like it was a pair of shoes, a commodity, that punish, ignore, and stigmatize key populations, populations at risk, at higher risk of HIV, these are the countries that were that fared worst, that were not able to achieve the 2020 goals. We know that young women in sub Saharan Africa continue to be left behind. Six out of seven new HIV infections amongst adolescents aged 15 to 19 years old in this region are among girls. Six out of seven new infections of young people, adolescents, girls. AIDS-related illnesses remain the leading cause of death among young women in Sub-Saharan Africa. This is all due to inequality, inequalities that women and girls face in this region. Almost 70 countries worldwide criminalize same-sex sexual relationships. 70 countries, gay men and other men who have sex with men, sex workers, transgender people, people in prison, and people who inject drugs. Are left with little or no access to health or social services, allowing HIV to spread amongst the most vulnerable in society. That is why the global AIDS strategy has ending inequalities that drive new infections and keep people from accessing health services at the heart, at its heart. The strategy sets new, what we call 10, 10, 10 targets on the removal of punitive laws that criminalize groups that are highly at risk and that <clears throat> and also the expansion of supportive laws and policies to fight stigma, discrimination, gender-based violence, and gender inequality. We have, to roll, we have to roll back punitive laws, laws that target people living with HIV and people at high risk of HIV, and, and we have to fight the informal rules in society that tolerate violence against women and girls, that tolerate homophobia, that target certain groups of people. We've got to fight those if we are going to end HIV AIDS. If we achieve these targets, the targets in the new strategy that we want now to be adopted at this high level meeting, we can prevent two and a half million new infections and 1.7 million AIDS related deaths by 2030. So my ask to you, honorable parliamentarians, is that as voice of all your citizens, you are the voice of your citizens, voice of the voiceless, the people left behind, exercise that power. Speak up for the people who suffer stigma and discrimination. Be courageous fighters for equality. Make fighting inequality the center of your work your budget work, your representational work, your legislative work, make challenging inequalities, particularly in health, a strong focus of your work. By fighting inequalities, we will not only end AIDS, we will strengthen our collective ability to overcome COVID-19. Let me be clear here. If we fight 
and win this battle that we are nearly going to win by 2030. That gives us the ability to fight and also end COVID-19. This is how pandemic preparedness is built. This is how resilience is built in health systems by fighting well against the epidemics that we face today. And this is how we ensure the right to health for all. Thank you very much. And I wish you a successful side event. Thank you very much, Mrs. Bianima. And I think I speak on behalf of everybody if I wish you all the success for the high level meeting that is necessary to come back on track, to come from talk to action and be assured in us parliamentarians, you have important allies in your struggle. I now come to my good friend, uh, Mark Angel. He is a member of the European Parliament from Luxembourg. And I also can tell you that he spent some years or some time of his life also in my beautiful hometown, Vienna, where he studied. Um, Mark, over to you. And as, a, as we are good friends, may I ask you to keep your time limit from three minutes, please? Yes, I will. Thank you very much, Petra. It's going to be difficult for me after such a passionate speech uh, of Winnie. So, but excellencies, uh, dear Winnie, uh, dear friends and colleagues, we as parliamentarians from all over the world, we really must welcome and we have to support the new global AIDS strategy adopted last March, ending inequalities, uh, ending HIV AIDS. And this new approach under the leadership of uh, UNAIDS Executive Director Winnie, which we just heard Winnie Bayanina, underlines the synergies and the links that exist between HIV AIDS and the 17 sustainable development goals. My two favorite uh, SDGs is number three, uh, good health and well-being, and number five, gender equality. And they are interconnected and they became even more relevant also now during the COVID pandemic. And we have seen just like with COVID, HIV AIDS, um, the, the, the women are um, affected disproportionately and uh, uh, the uh, COVID-19 has uh, aggravated existing inequalities. So we really have to fight inequalities. And to win the battle against HIV AIDS, we need progress in all 17 SDGs. That's the only way to end inequalities. As a parliamentarian, but also as an AIDS activist since the 1980s and uh, a UN AIDS champion, I really want to remind also that we must not forget key population and vulnerable populations. And it's important to name them. Winnie did it and I will do it again. Sex workers, drug users, men having sex with men, transgender person, and then other vulnerable persons, young women and girls, all victims of sexual abuse, migrants, and prisoners. And we need to tackle a key, um, key population specific challenges. And for this, I call on all governments to recognize and to reach out to all key population in full respect of their human rights and their dignity. To end AIDS uh, by 2030, we also need sustainable, sustainable funding. And uh, in the European Parliament, I recently called to the European Commission and to all 27 member states that we have to invest more in global health. And today I reiterate this call uh, at the global level to strengthen the support to UNAIDS and to all its partners. Sustainable and predictable funding is now and today more important than ever. We are almost at the end of it. So we cannot up now and we have to invest invest more in access to education and here I want to really congratulate UNAIDS and other multilateral partners for the launch of the new Education Plus initiative that enhances access to quality education and ultimately uh, the end the result will be the empowerment of girls and women and this is so important because women and girls have to be fully aware of their sexual and reproductive rights. As parliamentarians fighting HIV AIDS, we also must have a constant dialogue with our governments and not only the health ministers, but also pushing finance ministers to invest in access to health. And this will benefit, benefit job creation. It will make the labor ministers happy. So we really have to push for investment. And in this regard, I would also like to um, underline that we have to push uh, health and finance ministers to support community health workers. As politicians, we cannot aid, end AIDS alone. We must build bridges to civil society organizations and to the activists. And we need them as allies. They are not our enemies, they are our allies. 
And as a UNAIDS champion, I have visited uh, some of the partner countries of Luxembourg Development Aid in uh, Africa, and I witnessed once more how important their work is and their added value they have uh, when it comes to the AIDS response. A wonderful example is the Civil Society Institute of Health in West and uh, Central Africa, which is based in Senegal, and it's the first Francophone civil society institute to promote the fight against HIV AIDS. I'm very proud that I became a, a UNAIDS uh, a champion back in 2015 when I was a member of the Luxembourg Parliament. And now as a member of the European Parliament, I am still very um, enthusiastic and very committed uh, to fulfilling my duties as an advocate for UNAIDS. Dear Winnie, dear colleagues, yes, we can all together end HIV AIDS as a global health threat by 2030. So please, let's make it happen. Thank you very much. And I wish you a good afternoon in this meeting and a good high level meeting the next days. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, I just can echo you. Uh, human rights based approach uh, is one of the key um, success factors to, to, to combat uh, HIV AIDS. And I think that also access to sexual and reproductive health and rights, such as harm reduction, will be the other key, such as building bridges among different key players. So thank you very much. All the best for your important work. So now we have a slightly change in program, and we will now hear a video message from Barbara Lee, member of the United States House of Representatives. Thank you, Petra, for that very kind introduction. And thank you to all of the participants in this very important and timely discussion. Yes, it's been 40 years since the United States Centers for Disease Control and Prevention described the first five cases of what later became known as AIDS. As we recognize this anniversary, we must take the opportunity to remember and honor those we have lost recognize the progress made over 40 years and recommit to the ongoing bipartisan efforts toward ending the HIV epidemic in the United States and globally by 2030. Globally, an estimated 38 million people are living with HIV. More than 32 million people have died from AIDS-related illnesses since the start of the epidemic. The COVID-19 pandemic risks undermining decades of progress including access to testing and treatment for HIV. Especially as we face a global pandemic that has disproportionately impacted low-income, marginalized, and vulnerable communities around the globe, and yes, strained our public health systems, it is more critical than ever that we continue, continue to support HIV and AIDS care and resources Legislatures and parliaments have a leading role to play in making sure that we are responding to the needs of our people. As co-chair of the bipartisan and bicameral HIV and AIDS caucus in the United States Congress, I've been fighting alongside Representative Jennifer Gonzalez Colon to advance bipartisan legislation that addresses the HIV AIDS epidemic while educating our colleagues about the virus and its impact on affected populations. In Congress, sustained bipartisan support for United States leadership in ending AIDS has helped ensure continued progress through multiple administrations. Programs like PEPFAR, the Global Fund, and the Ryan White Program, the Minority AIDS Initiative, have all helped save millions of lives at home and across the globe and supported access to education, care, and life-saving treatment. As one of the original authors of PEPFAR and the Global Fund and the Office of Vulnerable Children, I can attest that from the very beginning, it has been vital to work on this in a bipartisan way, and it will be critical to sustaining it over time. These programs establish a model of care for epidemics that took into consideration all aspects of a person living with HIV, including the acknowledgement of systemic racism, poverty, and healthcare inequities in the United States and around the world. In Sub-Saharan Africa, 4,500 adolescent girls and young women contract HIV each and every week 
despite the existence of prevention tools to combat this. It's also critically important that we put an end to punitive laws that unfairly punish people living with HIV and AIDS. In Congress, I have introduced legislation once again to modernize our laws and policies to eliminate discrimination against those living with the disease. This includes permanent repealing laws that limit access to reproductive choice, especially as adolescent girls and young women are at the heightened risk for HIV and AIDS. It is unacceptable, unacceptable that legal structures place additional burdens on individuals solely as a result of their HIV status. All countries should ensure their legal frameworks, they treat people living with HIV and AIDS the same dignity and rights as their neighbors. And so I thank all of those joining this discussion today for their tireless commitment and support for working toward our shared goal of ending the HIV and AIDS epidemic. Thank you again. I remember it was really a pleasure to cooperate with Barbara Lee about 10 years ago in a, in a um, regional dialogue on the Global Commission on HIV and the law in Berkeley, and um, she's still uh, a fighter for our common goal. We now come to our panel discussion, which is about strengthening the HIV response through equity. And uh, I'm happy to introduce three distinguished panelists. Uh, the first one is this is Silvia Metetva. She is senator of the Kingdom of Eswatini, and she will um, talk about how is to uh, the, the COVID-19 pandemic affecting the HIV response, and what steps can be taken to ensure continued investment in HIV and health. Mrs. Metetva, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, moderator. Before I begin with the question at hand, may I take this opportunity to acknowledge the Inter-Parliamentarian Union, the Executive Director of UNAIDS, Winnie Baimena, and all protocol observed. Thank you so very much, moderator. With reference to the question, I am honored to give a positive response. I once again thank you, Madam Chair, and warm greetings from the serene and beautiful kingdom of Eswatini to all our dignitaries and panelists in attendance of this important side event. I greet you all. The Pan-African Parliament and the Parliament of the Kingdom of Eswatini are honored and privileged to be part of this important side event. As Parliament in the Kingdom of Eswatini, we are humbled by the support we get from their majesties and our line minister, His Excellency, the Right Honorable Prime Minister's office, which houses nature. Nature being the pinnacle in the HIV and AIDS response initiative in the country with the support of the legislative house. Notably, the speech from the throne always enshrines the robust fight against HIV and AIDS. Thus, Eswatin have shown great improvement over the last three years. Global HIV indicators also show that the number of new HIV infections are decreasing. AIDS related deaths are declining and people living with HIV on treatment are virally suppressed. May we have a round of applause for the Kingdom of Eswatini for such an improvement, ladies and gentlemen. More mothers are giving birth to children free from HIV, these are all positive signs that the kingdom of Eswatini is indeed on the right track to achieve its vision of ending AIDS as a public threat, health threat. In addition, globally we have attained the 95, 95, 95 global HIV target. This means that 95% of people living with HIV in Eswatini know their status. And another 95% of people who know their HIV positive status are accessing treatment. And finally, ladies and gentlemen, 95% of people who are on treatment have suppressed the viral load. The 95, 95, 95 deadline 
was initially set for 2030, meaning that Eswatini reached the target earlier in advance. I guess we need another round of applause, ladies and gentlemen, for the Kingdom of Eswatini. The COVID-19 pandemic is a global health emergency, and it is having a serious impact on the most vulnerable communities worldwide and threatens progress on HIV and AIDS. It, repre it represents a significant threat for people living with HIV and AIDS and for the global HIV response. Like HIV and AIDS, COVID-19 has a greater impact on people living with HIV, marginalized and key populations. As a result, ladies and gentlemen, the Pan-African parliamentarians are concerned as the pandemic spread to poor countries and those with higher HIV and AIDS rates. COVID-19 has significantly altered every life, not just for the kingdom of Eswatini, but for individuals all over the world. And despite the restrictions on movement as per the government uh, 19 guidelines, there has been a minimum reversal of the gains the country has made on the HIV response. The major setback has been on preventing of new HIV infections, particularly amongst adolescents and young women. This has been primarily driven by lack of reach and closure of schools. The number of pregnancies has been on the increase, which is an indication of unprotected sex, thereby presenting need for increased advocacy. Access to treatment was not affected in the kingdom. The Minister of Health introduced community-based service sites and multi-month distribution of art, which sustained treatment for people living with HIV. With the many adjustments that have occurred as a result of COVID-19, Nature commands the Parliament of the Kingdom of Eswatini for ensuring that HIV and AIDS continues to be in the forefront of the national development agenda in the quest to end AIDS as a public health. Despite the fiscal challenges facing government due to COVID-19, Eswatini continues to play a major role in providing treatment for people living with HIV, mainly through domestic resources. The challenge will, will be to sustain funding and support for AIDS programs and biological epidemics. The solution will be to devise efficient strategies through parliament to respond to similar epidemics such as COVID-19 and HIV and AIDS. So as legislators, we are overseers of government action and community leaders. Members of parliament are well placed to help expand knowledge and advocate for HIV programs. HIV should be in the national development agenda and every sector should demonstrate its commitment in addressing HIV. For the country to sustain the gains it has made over the years, legislators must continue to provide oversight Function in ensuring that sufficient resources are allocated to HIV programs. Parliament further commits to review and pass appropriate laws and policies that adversely affect the successful effect and equitable delivery of HIV prevention, treatment, care, and support programs. As legislators, overseers of government action and community leaders, members of parliament are well placed to help expand knowledge and advocate HIV programs. It has been proven that where parliamentarians are effectively engaged in the May HIV I ask process, you to conclude, please? May I ask okay. you to come to an end, please? Okay, no, that's fine. Let's just, sorry, go down. Uh, man, what's good? Go down. Okay. Okay, in, in conclusion, uh, ladies, um, in conclusion, uh, we, urge, uh, we then urge parliamentarians to support the expansion of the fiscal space by strengthening national public finan financial management capacity in order to improve tax collection and or increase the proportion of tax revenue collected as a percentage of GDP through equitable and efficient general general taxation and improvement uh, revenue collection. 
the Ministry of Finance and Tax Revenue Authority should be strengthened to achieve the following. I conclude now, one, advocate for innovative funding strategies and solutions for trans transition HIV specific funding sources to the mainstream health financing mechanism as many countries are moving towards the SDGs. Secondly, we need to urge governments to systematically analyze the future cost of HIV treatment in order to plan for the long term while reflecting on innovating domestic funding opportunities as well as health insurance and coverage for HIV and social security. The last one is there is an urgent need for our government to, mo to mono mobilize domestic resources to ensure sustainable and affordable access to HIV and AIDS. Lastly, ladies and gentlemen, uh, to this end, we parliamentarians are committed working with all partners, including UNAIDS, to support the implementation of the global AIDS strategy. I thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Senator Muntetra, for sharing the good example of Espatini with us. And now we go to Charles Goerens, who is also a member of the European Parliament, and he will speak about what is the role of regional cooperation on the HIV response and how can regional bodies influence laws and policies for stronger action at the country level? You have four minutes, please. Eh bien, merci. Uh, bonjour à tout le monde. Uh, against uh, AIDS the, on, uh, with an energetic manner. Before talking about the details of my presentation, I want to remind you of the fact that 20 years ago it wasn't easy because before we had to organize a treatment because it was the only way to make sure that people with a positive test were, weren't um, sentenced to death. Before, people were saying, well, we have to prevent. Prevention is less, less expensive. And other people were saying, even if we cannot do it not now, we cannot cure it now, we have to start somewhere. We cannot treat someone, everyone at the same time, but it doesn't mean that we don't have to, to say that. Um, and they were right saying that because the treatment now um, is available to almost everyone. How can we cooperate? Uh, on the European Parliament, I made a, a, a proposal and was accepted before the high level uh, meeting in New York, New York, it, that's going to start, to insist on the necessity of uh, going on with our efforts. We have to go on working to make sure we achieve the expected results. Uh, the results in 2030. And the Parliament has an essential role to play. Pa parliament in Europe and also a national U Parliament. My colleagues adopted the ideas, the central ideas of that resolution because everyone agrees we have to do everything possible to solve that problem by 2030. The European Union um, is a leader. This is why we insist on the fact that the Commission announces early on the means, the, the, the resources, the financial resource and the material resources to fight against disease in general, but in particular AIDS. And it's an essential role for all of the meetings on the pledging conferences on AIDS. The European Union is an, a, a, yeah, an engine uh, and a, uh, yeah, a leader because we, they allocate a lot of resources to fight AIDS. The Union, the European Union and the states, uh, supported by the Parliament, are uh, central players. The answer to the problem of AIDS involves several uh, 
uh, sectors. Everyone has to assume their responsibilities. The medical uh, sector, the political bodies, even if, oh yeah, on every level, the political sector can play a role. The UN, the member states with the UN, together with the uh, World AIDS Health Organization, WHO. So it makes a central fight against the AIDS and it gives us a structure that is very efficient. Oh, several actors with the implication of all of these bodies is the only uh, answer to AIDS. You asked me to talk about the regional answer, the co regional cooperation. You are therefore asking me to talk about uh, the way our regions in our uh, subnational entities can act. Well, if I understood well the question, my answer is the following. When I was in charge in the government of my country, with Bernard Kouchner, I took part in the initiative Esther, together for the therapeutic, therapeutical uh, initiative. So it was a cooperation between a hospital from the north and an hospital from the south of the country to provide a, a training for the health staff. And it was very efficient. To conclude, because I don't have a lot of time, it's the European Union is very aware of its responsibility in that fight against AIDS. In the following weeks, we want to do a program for the seven years to come. We're going to uh, um, give uh, 80 uh, billion plus 10 billions of euros for the co cooperation for development. So a huge part of it will be dedicated to health. Um, there are some measures uh, that we will implement and a big part of it will be dedicated to the fight against to, uh, to AIDS. Alors, uh, pour, uh... Merci, je vais conclure. Yes, to conclude, I will say that a measure that is for me very important, it's to make sure that all citizens from all countries have access to social security, which would be a, a driver to reduce inequality and that will allow everyone to uh, have uh, treatments. Thank you very much. Nancy, thank you very much uh, for this important input, uh, Mr. Goren. And now we come to Mrs. Felicia Iquam. She is director of the AIDS and Rights Alliance for Southern Africa. I would like to know how are you working to promote a human rights based approach to HIV AIDS? And what do you want to tell policymakers on addressing stigma and discrimination? Please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Your Excellencies, um, President of the Inter-Parliamentary Union, Ms. Winnie Bianyima, Executive Director of UNAIDS, Honorable Parliamentarians and fellow delegates. I greet you all from a rather cold and windy Bintuk in Namibia and uh, thank the Inter-Parliamentary Union for inviting me to participate in this highly esteemed panel and the side event. The AIDS and Rights Alliance for Southern Africa, also known as ARASA, was established in 2002 precisely to address the devastating impact of inequality and HIV-related stigma and discrimination in Southern Africa. The ARASA partnership, which has currently grown to consist of 100 organizations across 18 countries in Southern and East Africa, was born out of a need to catalyze a strong community response to the rampant violations of the rights to liberty, privacy, freedom of association, non-discrimination and equality before the law of people living with and vulnerable to HIV in their homes, schools, healthcare facilities and places of work and worship, which fueled HIV infections. We continue to do this 
by building a cadre of civil society leaders and organizations in the region who raise awareness and understanding by both communities and duty bearers about the need for human rights to be at the center of national HIV responses. We also generate and use evidence for evidence-based advocacy. An example of how we do this is how we map developments in law and policy in Southern and East Africa and use the recommendations of the HIV and the Law Commission to advocate for changes in the legal and policy environment. Our advocacy work also involves advising and influencing regional and international health policy and normative standards and advocating for political accountability by holding governments and other stakeholders accountable to their regional and global commitments, including the political uh, declarations that emanate from the high level meetings on AIDS. Collectively, we all know what works to address stigma and discrimination. This includes anti-stigma interventions at the community level led by people living with HIV and key populations and supported by social influences such as traditional and religious leaders. We also know that protective legal environments that aim to address inequality, protect against discrimination and increase access to justice are crucial. As has been mentioned already by my fellow panelists and other speakers um, in the previous session, Parliamentarians play a crucial role in addressing HIV related stigma and discrimination by removing legal barriers and enacting legislation which improves the HIV landscape and protects people living with HIV and key populations from discrimination. Further, parliamentarians can also use their oversight role to hold the executive accountable for putting in place policies and programs to reduce stigma and discrimination. Within their budgetary function, Parliamentarians can ensure adequate investment in the HIV response and particularly in structural interventions that address inequality and HIV related stigma. Finally, parliamentarians are leaders and social influencers who can influence public opinion, particularly to dispel misconceptions, stigma and taboo around um, HIV. The collaboration between civil society and parliamentarians is particularly important for promoting a rights based response to HIV. To illustrate this, I want to reflect briefly on the long-standing and mutually beneficial partnership between ARASA and the Southern Africa Development Community Parliamentary Forum, also known as SADC PF. This partnership is focused particularly on supporting legislatures in the SADC region to fulfill their role in addressing key and emerging HIV, sexual and reproductive health and human rights challenges. Over the years, We've collaborated successfully to develop the model law on HIV and AIDS in Southern Africa, amongst others, and have invested heavily in sensitizing parliamentarians on the role of the law in addressing HIV related stigma and discrimination. This work has had great impact at the national level, where, for example, civil society supported by ARASA and parliamentarians supported by SADC PF successfully lobbied for the removal of provisions criminalizing HIV transmission, exposure, and or non disclosure in national laws based on the recognition that these laws fuel stigma against people living with HIV and are disproportionately used to prosecute women and key populations such as sex workers and men who have sex with men. In closing, I want to share my favorite quote from the 2012 HIV and the Law Commission report, which states that the law often seems abstract and distant and it can be hard to comprehend, but for people living with HIV, for their families and communities, for key populations and those vulnerable to HIV, the law is neither abstract nor distant. It is police harassment or clean needles, prison cells or self-help groups. The law is the torturer's fist or the healer's hand. The bold new global AIDS strategy and the political declaration to be adopted during this week's high level meeting on AIDS give us all a new opportunity to renew our commitment and take bold action to address inequalities and stigma. Let us not fail to grab this opportunity to end the intersecting inequalities that are obstructing progress to ending AIDS as a public health threat by 2030. And with that, I thank you. I thank you very much for your very concrete recommendations of how we as parliamentarians could act. And we now will come to our interactive discussion. And um, I was asked to give first the floor to Ricardo yes, so, so, so later. Uh, the, he is a member of parliament in Portugal and founder and chair of UNITES, an organization that involves parliamentarians uh, in, on the issue 
on HIV AIDS. Mr. Mr. Leite, are you there? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Yes, please. You can, I can hear you. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. And I'd like to start by thanking the Interparliamentarian Union for their, their kind of in, uh, invitation for this important initiative. 20 years ago, the United Nations General Assembly convened its first ever special session to address a pandemic that was causing death and devastation on a tremendous scale, overwhelming communities and health systems. The truth is AIDS was an unprecedented global challenge and it was met with worldwide solidarity and action. This innovative approach engaged all countries and the most affected communities in decision-making and service delivery. However, 40 years after the first AIDS cases were reported, the AIDS epidemic is far from over. As we have seen recently, public health knows no, uh, no borders and it affects disproportionately the key populations and those in most vulnerable situations. Now it is, now it is time to garner the momentum to move forward with reforms of the global health system to fit our pressing need for global health security and global health equity. That is what we are doing at UNITE, the NGO that I preside to, which is a global network of parliamentarians committed to ending infectious diseases. And so the ultimate question is, how do we improve global health multilateral collaboration and mechanisms? And what tools do we have as elected officials at our disposal? Well, I've been working with a group of 29 experts that developed a set of recommendations to be better prepared to prevent next pandemics. This group, the Panel for a Global Public Health Convention, has drawn a few recommendations based on the lessons learned from the current global public health crisis that, we were recent, that were, was recently published in Lancet Public Health. And we concluded, in particular with the insights of my fellow colleagues in different parliaments, is that to successfully respond to current and future pandemics, we need to be bold and call for the following. Greater authority from a global governing body, an improved ability to respond to pandemics, an objective evaluation system for national core public health capacities, more, effect, more effective enforcement mechanisms. I cannot stress how important this is. Independent and sustainable funding and true representativeness and political leadership across the board. And yet we need to make it clear, tackling pandemics means giving power to community led services in hard to reach territories. We know through AIDS how important it is to work with community-based organizations, with non-governmental organizations. Universal health coverage is only truly universal if we reach everyone, including those that many times live in the margins of society, and only community-based organizations can reach them. Ensuring strong healthcare systems means protecting the most vulnerable with strong primary healthcare outcomes and treating people living with HIV means ensuring stigma-free and human rights-based policies that deliver patient-centered services. That's why UNITE, the Global Parliamentarians Network to End Infectious Diseases, is launching here today the Call for Action, where we call on our members spread across 75 countries to support the endorsement of the high-level meeting outcome document and facilitate the, ten, the attainment of the agreed set of HIV targets by 2025, with the central focus on 95, 95, 95 percentage coverage for testing and treatment for all subpopulations. Age May I also ask systems. you to conclude, please? Of course. And of course, the need to acknowledge the fourth 95, focusing on quality of life. Quality of life and well-being matter. Life, living is, needs to be more than just surviving. And so to end, and, and once and for all, we need to make sure that High level meetings are not just meetings, but an indicator that complacency has come too far and that we elected officials have the power to unite, to protect and preserve the rights of those living with HIV, to have happier and healthy lives and livelihoods. It's time to end the job we have started. It's time to end AIDS. It's time to unite. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Leite. Um, I have the problem now that on the one hand, I know that Mr. Goerens, who has to leave, would like to answer. On the other hand, I have seven MPs who request the floor and we have um, 19 minutes left for the whole session. So if I ask, may ask Mr. Goerens to answer totally briefly, uh, less than a minute and all the others, please 
keep to two minutes per person maximum. Raise your hand electronically. I will try to manage to see it uh, because due to an accident, I'm here in the in a field with my cell phone only. Um, and uh, I cannot follow all the chats and all the messages I get all the time. So please, uh, Mr. Gerens, one minute. I thought that people were going to ask me questions and that I was going to answer these questions. Yes, you have one minute. But on the interventions that have just been made? And I do not have a translation on my cell phone. So I just understand that you would like to answer a question. Please go ahead. Those are one minute only. And if you do not want to answer a question, I would proceed with those who would like to take the floor. First uh, of all, I learned that it is- No, 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 no. I, You would like to answer. If, if I have well understood- okay. go, uh, go ahead. If I One have minute, well understood, uh, I would like to uh, to reply to the yeah. answers. Yep, I would please. Re reply to the questions raised, raised now. Yeah, please, There were no, no specific question addressed to me. That's right. So if you do not have to, there was no specific question to you, that, that's right. So if we can get to the other MPs who would like to ask questions, even if you have to leave now, I know uh, it would be fine if you could proceed, okay? Okay, then I learned that uh, Princess Kashmir from Zimbabwe would like to take the floor. And I tell you, I also have requests from Morocco, Syria, Thailand, India, and two times Tanzania. So please, uh, Princess Kashmir from Zimbabwe. Okay, she is not in the meeting anymore. So we come to Morocco. M might the distinguished uh, MP from Morocco um, unmute and take the floor, please. It's yours. Thank you, dear moderator. So thank you. Thanks to our political will, the fight against HIV AIDS, it's at the top of our agenda. We have a very strong reduction of infection rates. And this is thanks to a national strategy which facilitates the access of people who live with HIV AIDS to centers for treatment and healthcare checks. We have very little infection rates. This means that in our country, there are less and less people being affected by the disease. In 2019, we had about 2,000 people infected. Although the situation is stable, the issue of AIDS is very worrying. So we did an assessment of the National Strategic Plan in 2021. And this showed another emergency plan of extension that needs to be implemented by 2023 to to divide by two the number of inf infections by HIV until 2030. So this extension plan has a priority, which is to reinforce a favorable environment in terms of human rights, to allow access to services of prevention and treatment through adapted law, through an adapted budget, and an evaluation and assessment of the law in place. So we need to have an answer to HIV AIDS. Our aim is zero infection, zero deaths by 2030. Please come to an end. 
Of course, our role, as I said, our goal is health for all, for all without discrimination. We have a very ambitious goal and we hope to have universal coverage for all and lower the number of people living with HIV AIDS and ensure care for all. Thank you. Oh, um, Mrs. Uh, Fatma Tufkik from Tanzania. You have two minutes, maximum Hello. two minutes, yeah? Hello, thank you very much. Yeah, uh, Your Excellency, the President and uh, the Executive Director and the rest of the members of Parliament present also would like to take this opportunity to thank uh, UNAIDS for having this uh, 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 this meeting. Actually, I'm from Tanzania, and uh, in Tanzania we have the rate of four point four. But since the term is very much limited, I would just like to highlight uh, what the Parliament of United Republic of Tanzania has done. Actually. The Parliament of the Republic of Tanzania supports the efforts of the global community, community and the, the Standing Committee for HIV and AIDS and Drugs provides direct oversight to the Tanzanian Commission for AIDS, which is the overall coordinating body for the national response. Also through the, through the Parliament, through its committee, spearheaded the establishment of the Tanzania AIDS Trust Fund, which is a vehicle for mobilizing domestic resources to finance the national response to HIV and AIDS. Through its work, the committee ensure equitable availability of resources to deliver the services to all communities in need. Actually, as you told me that it's just some few minutes, we had so many things that would loved to share with you, but since we don't have enough time, these are some of the issues which our committee does. Thank you very much. And the next time you will have hopefully more possibility. So I learned that uh, Princess you. Kashwe from Zimbabwe is back now again in the meeting. May I ask you to take the floor, please? You have to unmute yourself yes. and then, um, yeah? Okay. Yeah, uh, just a minute. Um, actually, I am from Zambia, not Zimbabwe. I'm very sorry. That's all right. I am uh, Honorable Princess Kasune from Zambia. And uh, I want to take this opportunity very quickly. I know that time is not with us uh, to really appreciate all those uh, that have already spoken ahead of us. Uh, as a member of parliament living with HIV personally since 1997, and been an advocate, really spoken not only in my country, but around the world, and ending up as a member of parliament in uh, 2016, and now recontesting again, we are actually in the middle mm -hmm. of uh, campaigns right now. So I am aspiring, um, having been in parliament for a term, having worked with SADC PF, and indeed to be given the opportunity to speak uh, by uh, IPU, we really appreciate this. And uh, all I can add is that um, I have also been affected with COVID-19. And so it really speaks volumes to the need of parliamentarians to continue uh, pushing the agenda of 2030. But beyond that, to ensure that as members of parliament, we do not negate that not only are we members to speak for our people, but there are people living with HIV who are members of parliament who may not have maybe the tenacity or the courage to speak out as being positive themselves. Uh, I have tried in my country, Zambia, even when I was elected, uh, to use my time for the maiden speech to really rally the support for people living with HIV, to also showcase that people living with HIV are not just vulnerable people, there are people in decision-making, and we also have the vulnerable faces, of course, 
of mostly the women, the girls, and indeed our men are needed for this cause if we are going to win it. So the few words that I add is not only should we take advantage of the members of parliament who are actually in parliament, but also let's not lose the, in, the intelligence, the wisdom, the, intellect, the intellectual property that a lot of members of parliament are going away with because they are not coming back to parliament. How can we governize that? Uh, when you look at the turnaround in the Zambian parliament, it's almost over 70%. So that is my call that let's not lose the critical members who are once members of parliament who may not be able to come back so that we can continue the fight. Thank you. You so are very absolutely much. right. Thank you very much for this testimony. Colleagues, now we can have the chance to be solidaristic and everybody of you can have one minute only. So if so, but if you're really restricted to one minute, I can call um, Honorable um, Shong Desa as, as next, and then Syria, Thailand, India, and Mongolia, if we manage to do that. So Hon Honorable Shong Desa, are you with us? If so, please take the floor. But it doesn't seem so, so I hand over to Syria, please. There are our Et, yeah. Bonjour, Monsieur Dan. Bonjour, j'ai le plaisir de. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. It's an honor to share with you this event, to be participating in this event on HIV/AIDS. Syria has very few infected people, people living with HIV, but the health ministry in Syria provides health care services to all citizens, including HIV AIDS treatments. This treatment is free of charge to all citizens because the state guarantees health, the health of all citizens according to our constitution. I will now ask my colleagues in Parliament to help us raise the sanctions against our people and to help us to fight against terrorism. We need to have to stop external foreign forces that are active in our country. In our country, the state allows treatment to all citizens, to all people. This treatment is free of charge for all. We are working in parliament and we implement all that is needed for equality for all and equal access Bullet for all. Merci. Thank you so much. A colleague from Thailand. Okay, Madam Moderator, my honorable colleagues, uh, Thailand has uh, made a considerable so progress the, in preventing the, and controlling uh, the spread of uh, HIV uh, in the past 20 years due to our comprehensive HIV prevention, care policy and treatment program, which are highly subsidized under our universal health coverage scheme. With our current national strategy to end AIDS by 2030, Thailand is determined to reduce new HIV infection, reduce HIV and AIDS related death, and cut down discrimination related to HIV and gender. We are also proud to say that in 2016, WHO commended Thailand as the first country in Asia and second country in the world to eliminate mother to child transmission of HIV and syphilis. Despite such an achievement, prevailing social stigma and discrimination against people living with HIV, especially in employment, still need more attention from all stakeholders, including parliamentarians. In 2007, Thailand has revoked a requirement for government employees to be HIV free and ban 
non-voluntary HIV testing as a barrier to carrier promotion in government service. Further, in December last year, the Ministry of Labor has issued its landmark ministerial directive aiming to curb employment discrimination against HIV-affected group and at risk population in private businesses while respected they are privacy could and proficiency. Could you okay. please conclude? Thank you. Yes, these are a lot of uh, examples since law and law enforcement alone are never enough to deal. So we have to have the awareness raising. And these are also some examples how the parliament can help the public eliminate prejudice and misconception and develop non-discrimination attitude toward those living with HIV, treating them with the respect and dignity. Thank you, Absolutely. Madam. Absolutely. Congratulations. Thank you very much. And over to India. <laughs> One minute. Thank you, Petra. Honorable IPU President, Executive Director, UNAIDS, Honorable Parliamentarians, Distinguished Guests. Uh, in India, we are committed to achieve end of AIDS as a public health treat by 2030 as a signatory of the UN SDGs. Our commitment has been emphasized in our National Health Policy 2017. The National AIDS Control Organization formulates the policy and implements programs for the prevention and control of the HIV epidemic in India. The National AIDS Control Program Phase 4 is under implementation as a 100% central sector sponsored scheme. Targeted interventions, revamping, strategy guides have been developed. This includes, among others, strengthened outreach activity, community-based screening and biomedical waste management, peer navigations, index testing, mapping and population size estimations, secondary distribution of needle and syringes, satellites, OST centers, community scorecards. The government has developed seven years national strategic plan for HIV AIDS STD 2017-2024 to achieve 2030 sustainable development goals. The government of India launched the free entry retroviral therapy program on 1st April 2004 at eight government hospitals. As on December 2019, 1.36 million infected, HIV infected people are availing free lifelong ART from 552 ART. Come to an end. Please another 30 an seconds. End. Another 30 seconds, ma'am. That's half uh, of a minute. Uh, yes, the HIV AIDS Act has been enacted in 2017, which is a major legal reform in strengthening the prevention and treatment of HIV infections and safeguard the rights of people living with HIV. It defines discrimination as denial or discontinuation of employment, education, health care services, renting or residing property, public or private office, insurance and public facilities. Today, parliamentarians have representative leadership, legislative resource mobilization, and oversight roles as part of their duties and responsibilities. They could build Thank you very much. on the passage of necessary legislations and ensure continuous and sustained government attentions to issue Thank you very to much. HIV and human rights. Thank you very much. Petra. Wonderful. Thank you. So, so I really have to apologize, uh, Mongolia, Nicaragua, Tanz Tania, I thought that you all would like to speak. I'm really sorry we ran out of time, which is also a good sign, as we have so many really well-engaged parliamentarians who are fighting uh, to, uh, to, to, and they are very committed. Uh, but I now come to our closing remarks by Mr. Jose Ignacio Echaniz. He's vice chair of the IPU Advisory Group on Health and member of Parliament of Spain. Please also keep <laughs> as short as possible. Please, the floor is yours, Jose. Thank you very much, dear Petra, uh, distinguished members of parliament, ladies and gentlemen. It is a pleasure to address you at the end of this event. I would like uh, to thank tonight uh, for their valuable contribution to thank uh, in making this a successful event. I also warmly thank uh, all the speakers and participants for uh, a very rich discussion. It is time to turn these words into action. I hope that you will leave this event uh, motivated to do everything in your power to end AIDS. Uh, first of all, promote laws and policies uh, that put human rights at the center uh, and remove the barriers that stand in the way of people assessing HIV 
and health services. Call for a review of uh, your country's legal framework to empty it from uh, any discriminatory uh, provision and use your oversight power to make um, sure implementation of uh, laws and policies does not have a negative impact on women, girls, uh, key population and people living with HIV and AIDS. Secondly, uh, advocate for investments in HIV and health as an investment in your country's proper prosperity. Ending AIDS and achieving the sustainable development goals is for everybody and we should all be the champions of those left behind to defend their rights in Parliament, in the media, and uh, of course, in our constituencies. Finally, uh, last but not uh, least, let us work together. Each and every one of us becomes stronger with the cooperation with others. I therefore call on you to work with all stakeholders in your countries with the common objective of building more equal societies and improving the well-being of all citizens. And let us collaborate in our regions and at the global level, uh, the IPU stands ready to continue working with uh, UNAIDS and other partners to strengthen the HIV response. Thank you very much, dear friends. Thank you very much, Jose Ignacio. Uh, and thank you all the colleagues who were so engaged uh, in this debate. For, thanks for all the calls of action. And at the very end, I would like to ask the participants to respond to two polling questions to evaluate the event. Uh, the answers are anonymous. So I think you already see on your screen answer number one. If you might just tip on on this uh, question, uh, on this answer, which fits most um, from your point of view. So uh, may I call once more everybody to answer question number one, how would you rate the extent to which you have acquired new information or knowledge? Ah, I, I see that both questions are at the same poll. And so you also can ask answer the second question, which I cannot see on my cell phone. Sorry for that. So please also answer the second question. Um, and I want to thank you very much for your participation, IPU, for organizing this event. And I hope to see you soon again, hopefully not only via screen, but live. And have a good day, a good time, a good evening, a good morning, wherever you are. All the best. And it was a pleasure meeting you. Bye.